Hello, Mestorians. We are the people who love history, but we like the mess in it too. And our show is finally back, and it starts with hats. Easter hats, that is. It's Easter Day in 1883, the next year after the Season 1 storyline of The Gilded Age. We're in Season 2, Episode 1. The title of this episode is You Don't Even Like Opera. My plan is to give you a few videos for each episode and just focus on one or two aspects of the show instead of a full recap. In this video, I'm going to start where they started, at the church. And you know that I like to do a little extra digging, so I have a couple of news articles to share with you from this time period. One of them is from March 25th, 1883, which was Easter Sunday of that year, which would coincide with the date of this episode. So we'll get to those articles and episode one. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Miss History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and hit that like button to support this video. Thank you. Now on to why you are here. At the start of the episode, we see all of the ladies opening their hat boxes then getting dressed up in their beautiful dresses for Easter Sunday, upstairs and downstairs and over in Brooklyn at the Scotts house. You can't help but notice that the Van Rynes and Russells are in bright Easter colors and Peggy is dressed in black as if she is mourning. Then we find out later that she is. Her son has passed away. And poor Bertha can't get a seat at the opera house. As she said in season one, we've all got our troubles. The big money families are attending St. Thomas Episcopal Church, and you know that everything has to be done correctly and fashionably in this crowd, and apparently that even includes going to church and praising the Lord. So this church was built on Fifth Avenue at 53rd Street, and was nestled in between those great mansions built by Richard Morris Hunt and Stanford White, who were mentioned last season. Shameless plug here, I have been making videos about the people from this show who were real life people. Stanford White is one of them, the guy who built the Russell's Palace. He was a very naughty guy who led a very scandalous life. After this video, you should check out that one and I'll link a playlist to all of my Gilded Age content in the description box. But back to the church. The one in this show that they were attending was the second St. Thomas. It was built in 1870. And so at this time, it would have been a relatively new church. The original St. Thomas Episcopal Church was built in the 1820s. And one of its founding fathers was William Backhouse Astor, Caroline Astor's father-in-law. It's funny to me that the church seems to be following the path of high society. Because remember last season, how the talk was all about how the Fashionable people lived more north of the city, and yesterday's men, as Bertha called them, lived more south, like the house that the Russells had just moved from. So this Fifth Avenue location was the right part of town. And the original St. Thomas's, I guess, would have been yesterday's church because of its now unfashionable location. So we know that Bertha Russell is her own character, and this show mixes in these fictional families with people who really existed at that time. But it's obvious that the fictional characters take bits and pieces from some of those real people. And Bertha Russell has a lot of parallels to Alva Vanderbilt, who forced her daughter, Consuelo Vanderbilt, to marry the Duke of Marlborough. And they got married at this church at St. Thomas's. Now, we keep hearing Bertha say that nobody is good enough for Gladys. Remember poor Archie Baldwin? He wasn't good enough for her, even though he seemed to check all of the society boxes. He came from the right kind of family. He had the right kind of profession. He knew all of the right people. But Bertha keeps hinting that she's got big plans for Gladys. So are we thinking that Bertha is going to follow the path of Alva Vanderbilt and force Gladys to marry some European nobility aristocrat type guy. That's what I'm thinking, but let me know what you're thinking about that. And again, church continues to follow society's order. The servants don't even attend church with their masters or employers. It sounds so horrible to say masters, but anyway. And then the black people go to an entirely different church. And remember though, 
that Peggy's family is upper middle class. So there was likely some similar hierarchy placed in the black churches as the white churches in that time. Level of income was likely a factor as well as one's skin tone and hair texture. It might sound weird if you don't know about it, but all of those things played a role in deciding where Black Americans were placed on the social totem pole. I touched on this subject in my video about the Blue Vein Society. They were the Black people who started forming their own social circles right after slavery was abolished. Their main standard was that your skin must be light enough for your veins to be visible in order to be a part of their club. Now, at the Servants' Church, we have everybody giving Chef Borden a hard time, but he seems to be taking it well. Remember, we thought that he was the French chef, but he was putting on airs, uh, pretending to be French, but he can still cook French food, so I guess everything is going to be okay. I do wonder, though, what's going to happen when the news about him gets out to the rest of the society ladies. Maybe that's something that Mrs. Astor will be able to take and use to her advantage in her war against Bertha Russell, uh, because we saw that Bertha, you know, had a win at the end of this episode. We won't talk about it on this one, but I do want to see them go back and forth with each other. It seems like we're supposed to be on the side of Bertha Russell. And I guess ultimately it seems like she's going to be the one who's going to win in the end. But I want for Mrs. Astor to get some wins in too. I think that that'll make it a more fun show to watch. And also at the Servants Church, we have Jack, a.k.a. John. So, so I figured it out. I believe that his name is John, and I guess that's his formal name. And at the Van Rines house, the Van Rines call him John, but he seems to introduce himself as Jack. And so I guess like informally, he's known as Jack. He introduces himself to the Russell's lady's maid, Adelheid, and he asks her if she'd like to have a coffee with him sometime. Remember after he took Bridget to that picture show last season? After the show let out, he really wanted to take her out for coffee too. I wonder if he thinks having coffee is like getting to first base. I don't know. Or maybe he has a crippling caffeine addiction that we'll explore when the show takes a really dark turn. Bridget, though, she seems to be okay with his flirtations with Edelhide because he invites her over to the Van Rines house to have tea with the servants, and they all seem to have a really pleasant conversation, and Bridget is interacting with her, and it doesn't seem like anything is, you know, brewing there as far as jealousy is concerned. But I do wonder if Bridget will start to get jealous, or is Jack trying to make her jealous? What do you think about that? Because remember, when Bridget didn't want to deal with him last season and he went off to take his walk to visit his mother's grave, she was curious about where he was going, curious enough that she wanted to follow him to see what he was up to. So maybe she does really like him, but just doesn't know how to express herself because of the personal stuff that we saw that she was dealing with last season. But maybe we'll get to explore that a little bit later. But let me know, do you think that he's trying to make her jealous or does he really have a thing for Adelheid, does he just want to find a young woman who he can, you know, have a relationship with? And also, is Jack, a.k.a. John, going to become a rich man? Because remember, at the season finale, he asked Bridget if she wished that she had been invited to the Russell's ball. He said that one day they could get invited to some place like that because this is America and anything was possible. And he hinted at something similar in this episode, basically saying that he had some ideas, but he didn't know how to make them happen. He definitely has aspirations beyond service for himself. And I wonder if we're going to get to see some of that come to fruition for him in the course of this show. And now to Peggy and her family who are having the saddest Easter of all. She and her parents, Arthur and Dorothy, they travel to Philadelphia to join the Spring family in their grief, and they are the ones we find out who adopted Peggy's son. And her son, who she was desperately trying to find, has died of the scarlet fever. Poor Peggy. This is awful. This is awful for the whole family. She gets to see his bedroom, 
and take home a photo of him, uh, which was great. You know, that was what his adoptive father allowed her to do. And are we seeing maybe some type of romantic spark between Peggy and her son's adoptive father? Because, you know, his wife also died and he does seem to be being very friendly to Peggy. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Let me know what you think about that. But her getting to see his room and have that picture of him, that does bring her some comfort. And to me, it seems like Peggy's mother is angrier at Peggy's father than Peggy is. What do you think about that? I think that Arthur, her father, feels badly for what he did. But I do think that he did what he did out of love. Even though he was totally wrong in how he went about everything, I do think that it came from a place of just him trying to carve out the best life that he could for his daughter. But he just did it all the way wrong. He was wrong about it. He tells Dorothy, hey, the kid died from scarlet fever. You can't blame me for scarlet fever. And she replies something along the lines of, well, I can blame you that we didn't get here sooner. And this whole situation is so sad. It's so sad because they think that they could have saved him, but it's just too late. And that's got to be driving them insane. Now, I've got to say, I'm looking forward to seeing more of Rector Luke Forte, I believe is his name. He was in my favorite scene of this episode when we find out that his next big service is a wedding ceremony. He's really glad that he got through Easter. That's like a big deal for him. I'm sure that as like a, an Episcopalian rector, that's like his Super Bowl Sunday. But now he's got his first wedding. And this wedding ceremony is for Miss Bingham and Mr. Rakes, he tells the crowd. Do you know them? And their reactions were priceless. Everyone gave a different answer at the same time. Agnes gave a firm, loud no. Ada says, a little. Marion says, yes. And Oscar says, not really. <laughs> so they all gave a different answer at the same time. I love that. It made me laugh. And of course, right, that social climbing adventurer is getting married at St. Thomas's. Hey, Agnes might have been mean about it, but she was right about Mr. Rakes. Is Marion ever going to listen to her sweet Aunt Agnes? I don't know. But back to St. Thomas's church, the church in real life. Remember Ward telling Bertha that she has arrived because she got a church pew opposite the Astor's? I get what he was saying, but if I can recall correctly, it looked like Caroline Astor was opposite Bertha, but a few pews in front of her as well. Well, there wasn't merely assigned seating. The St. Thomas Church leased its pews to the rich families, allowing them to have like kind of permanent seating there. Remember when Caroline and Carrie Astor came strolling into Easter service fashionably late? The church was crowded, yet they weren't rushing trying to get a seat. They took their time and they made their way to the front because they knew that their pew was waiting on their rich heinies to get in it. And that was a well-known practice of St. Thomas Episcopal Church, and it helped them to raise a lot of money. And I have a newspaper article from December 22nd, 1873, that mentions it. It's in the New York Times, and the writer just took a little dig at St. Thomas's. So the St. Thomas that's shown in the show was a parent church to another St. Thomas location, I guess that we would call it like a satellite location today, like some of the mega churches have nowadays. Our Gilded Age St. Thomas is on the corner of 5th Avenue and 53rd Street. Even according to this article, this is what it says in part, quote, The parent church, St. Thomas's Church, corner of 5th Avenue and 53rd Street, was also preparing to celebrate its semi-centennial anniversary, end quote. But here's how it starts when referring to the smaller, unglamorous location. Quote, Yesterday was the first anniversary of St. Thomas's Protestant Episcopal Chapel, located in 60th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. The neat and comfortable little edifice, the seats of which are free, was well filled. 
end quote. And that's the dig, the shade, if you will, the seeds of which are free. In other words, not to be confused with the rich people's stuck up church. This is the St. Thomas with free seating. Anyway, what are your predictions for the next episode and for this season in general? Put them in the comments and I'll make another video highlighting them before episode two comes out. Are Peggy's parents headed for divorce? Is Jack going to become a cheating playboy? Is he going to become a rich man? Will Marion have a coincidental run-in with Mr. Rakes? Tell me all of your thoughts, all of your predictions. You know that I do my best to reply to as many comments as possible, and I will still do that. And in the next video for episode one, we'll get into Marion's new job and Oscar's brutal attack. If I left out something that you wanted me to discuss from this episode, put it in the comments and keep in mind that I'm not done talking about this episode. And let me know if you want to talk about this show on a live stream. That's what I was going to do at first. But each episode gives me a little something more to research. And I just feel like I need to make a video like this one instead of going live. But we'll figure it out as we go. And if you want to see my videos about the real life people who are characters in this show, check out my Gilded Age playlist. I'll leave a link to it. I've made videos about Ward McAllister, Stanford White, T. Thomas Fortune, and the lady who is the real life inspiration for the Mrs. Chamberlain character. And I'm going to do some more. So if you have suggestions for real life people who were in this show that you want me to make videos about, or even real life places and events that are covered in the show, if you want me to make a video about those things, Put them in the comment section. The ones that I can research and make a video about, I will. Just give me a little bit of time to get it done because this does take some research to get these out to you. And if you've made it this far in the video, I truly, truly thank you. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, my Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon. Ties too hot, hot mess history. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box.